Hello, and welcome, everybody. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, welcome to the King Center. I'm Kate Casey. I'm associate professor over in the Graduate School of Business. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you like, a little bit about what the King Center is. So the mission of the King Center is really to help improve the lives of poor people or people living in poverty all around the world. And we aim to do this in sort of three major ways. So the first is supporting uh, research, so research that informs both policy and practice in global development. Second is uh, training the next generation of leaders and thinkers. So I see many of you in the audience, so thank you for coming. Um, and then the last is to foster conversations like this one uh, with leading thinkers on you know, current and pressing topics on the, in, in global development. And I just want to say we are super lucky because we actually have Bob and Dottie King here with us in the audience, so we are very grateful for your, for your leadership. Um, yay! And it's my great pleasure to introduce Hakim Bello Osagie, who is, um, he's a Nigerian entrepreneur, but that, that just is the tip of the iceberg with the breadth and depth of his experience and accomplishments. Uh, just to give a few highlights, he spent, he spent 10 years uh, in government first. We so worked for the president's office in Nigeria before getting, I don't know, the, the entre, entrepreneurial bug. Uh, started a few ventures. I hear the first one was a challenge, but the second one was a great success. Um, he has like wide-ranging uh, commitments and, and leadership roles. And I just want to I want to touch on on a few. Uh, so he's the chairman of the board of SF, FSDH Holding Company. Um, he is a is on the international advisory boards of Equinor, which is a Norwegian energy company, uh, Brookings Institution, on the Council of Foreign Relations, and he has just an incredible breadth of experience. So he took. He took over UBA, the first kind of major Nigerian bank to be uh, taken over, and had spent six years working on that. He's worked in oil and gas. He's so finance. He's worked in telecoms, and it just and it's an amazing breadth and depth of experience. And so we're really honored to have him here. So he also he teaches at Harvard Business School, and we are super fortunate that he has started teaching at the GSB. And he's teaching an immersive course this quarter. And I have a couple students who I've heard from. They're absolutely raving about it. So we're, we're super honored to have him here tonight. Um, so please join me in welcoming Hakim. So Hakim, I wanted, so we'll just have a few kind of questions here. And then about halfway through, we'll open it up. So think about the questions that, that you might like to ask him. But I just like, given that just the, the highlights of your career, I mean, it's incredibly impressive and you have experience in government and in the private sector and across a range of industries. You've been investor and founder and advisor and teacher. How, what, what was your journey? How did you get here? How can we be like you? <laughs> uh, look, uh, Catherine, I, we'd really like to thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I have to be honest and tell you that whenever I'm introduced like that, I really do not recognize the person they're talking about. <laughs> but thank you very much. And I would also like to uh, thank, acknowledge uh, Robert and Dottie King for the tremendous work that they have done. Um, I would very much like to be 10% of them. That is to do very well in the private sector, to make a lot of money, and then give most of it away in good causes. So thank you very much for your presence here and for what you have done. Um, um, as a young boy, um, I think that the critical two years of my life was mm. attending a place called the United World College of the Atlantic, uh, which was an international school, uh, which preached very much um, the importance of inclusion, uh, the importance of going across barriers mm. of religion, of race, of, of, uh, of, of gender, um, and as well, as well of class. And that influenced me a lot. And it turned me very much towards seeking both public service and, uh, and private work as well. Mm -hmm. And so when I left Harvard Business School, um, I left to take the lowest paid job in my class. And that was a job in the Nigerian government. And I have no regrets about that, because my feeling at the time was that the oil and the gas sector was the sector that would make the most dramatic impact on mm -hmm. Nigeria's development. I did that for several years and uh, enjoyed it very much. 
and, um, and I left that uh, because I saw a gap that a lot of major international companies that wanted to do business in the government of Nigeria and wanted to do business in Africa didn't know how to go about it. And I thought that I could be a very useful bridge in connecting both of them mm -hmm. so that they could speak a common language and work together. And I was reasonably successful with that. And I worked a lot with the Japanese, funnily enough, because they, in some sense, were furthest away from Africa. Mm. I then decided, um, overestimating my abilities, to become an entrepreneur. And you know when you've been an advisor and a consultant, you have the illusion that you know more than an entrepreneur does. And my first venture was a complete failure. <laughs> um, at the time, I thought that it was my fault 20%. Uh, I now realize it was my fault 90%. Um, but I learned a lot from that, and after that, I had successes in setting up the first securities trading company and then staging a hostile takeover of a large government-owned bank, which on day one, when I entered, I realized was, was bankrupt, mm. and I realized that its accounts were actually works of fiction rather than reality, and I hope that is not the case with any bank in the United States. <laughs> Um, I, 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 did, uh, I was an entrepreneur for, for in several other industries. Mm -hmm. And then in the last five years, um, what I've spent, last 10 years, what I've spent more and more time is in education, mm -hmm. because I believe that education is so fundamental in the way in which it shapes the way young people think and the way they behave, and it makes them even greater leaders. And that's part of the reason why I went back to Harvard Business School, why I was involved in African Leadership Academy, and the reason why I'm here today. Yeah, amazing. Can I ask you some very big, big picture questions? When you think about starting in Nigeria mm -hmm. and, then, and then expanding, you know, where is the economy at? Where are politics at? What are the key opportunities? What are the key constraints? Like, where is Nigeria now? Where is it going? Mm -hmm. Starting there and then, and then spreading broader across other African markets. Um, I think that um, Nigeria is in many ways in a good position. It does have its weaknesses. It's in a good position in the sense that I think the various groups in the country have agreed a for political formula whereby they work together, mm. irrespective of religion and irrespective of the ethnic group. That is a big plus. I think they're in a good position because there is widespread acceptance of democracy and the presidential system of democracy. Right. I think we're in a good position because there's also widespread acceptance that um, a form of capitalism, and I'll say capitalism with a social safety net, mm. is largely accepted. So at least those basic issues, I think, have been settled. I think that we are not in a good position and that I think that we need to um, develop better leaders mm. than the ones we have right now. Mm. I think that too many of the able people have gone into the private sector. They have ended up being lawyers, like my dear wife. They've ended up being academics, like my parents. They've ended up being, like myself, teaching at Harvard Business School. And we need more of such people in the government. So the government cannot be something that we sneer at and we say we don't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. It has to be a place which we see as our future. Because ultimately, the biggest questions of our society are determined by the actions of people in the government, in the presidency, in the Senate. And they set the tone and they circumscribe what can be done and what cannot be done. And I think that if we get that right, then the natural leadership position that Nigeria occupies in Africa with countries like South Africa, with countries like Kenya, with, with, with countries like uh, uh, Egypt, we can then form and make real an Africa-wide common market, mm -hmm. which will have the size of an India mm -hmm. or the size of a China, and which in the longer term, I think, stands the possibility of being the manufacturing base for the world. Mm. Now, that, for me, is my vision and what I see 
Africa's position in the world, and it's going to be up to my generation to advise and your generation, the younger ones, to execute. Mm. So I, I just want to pick up on something you said, because it's something I feel very passionately about, too. When I think of like the students that we, we have the privilege of teaching here, and their passion and their skills, how can we direct some of them towards governments? Because this is something I wonder about, because they have such fantastic, uh, lucrative opportunities outside government. What, what can we do better? Um, I do think that um, more and more of the students, especially at business schools, are doing joint programs. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very welcome development. Law and business, technology and business, government and business. And that already tells me that there's a certain yearning mm. among young people to do more than just be in business. Mm -hmm. I also think that more people of the next generation are going to be doing several careers. Like my generation, you did, you did something, you went into an area, and you stayed there for the rest of your life. And if you change that, you have to explain to your parents as to has he gone cuckoo. You've got to explain to your dear wife or your husband as to why are you straying off. But it was regarded as something strange. Mm. But I think that we have another generation of people who will do work in government and do work in business. Um, one of my heroes when I grew up in Nigeria, strangely enough, was um, a Californian called Robert Strange McNamara. Mm. Um, very controversial, but I admired him because he taught at Harvard Business School. He was one of the whiz kids who worked for the United States Defense Department in the Second mm. World War. He then worked in Ford Motor Company and become, became president of Ford. Mm. He then became Secretary of Defense and did a lot of excellent work on arms control. Mm. Though, of course, he made mistakes in Vietnam. And then he ended his career working for the poorest of the poor as president of the World Bank. Mm. Now, mm. for me, his career, in many ways, is a model career. Mm. And though, at his time, it was unusual, I think that the next generation, those of, those of you who are at Stanford and other places here today, I think that that will be your pattern and you'll bring some of the lessons that you've learned in the private sector, the public sector, and some of that public ethos that you've gained in the government to work in the private sector. Mm, great. And just because it's so timely, you mentioned how like, the political leadership is so important for, you know, if we, if we look at Nigeria, there was a very contentious election yes. last month and a very unusual election with a you know, strong third party candidate, yes. but incredibly low, record low yeah. voter turnout. So it's like a mix of headwinds and tailwinds and a lot of sort of conventional, not rules, but sort of gentlemen's norms were kind of upended. It seems like it's a very different election than we've seen in a while. What, what, how, how do you read that? What, how should we interpret that? Um, funnily enough, I have the complete opposite view mm. um, of that. <laughs> um, first of all, I don't think that there was a low turnout. I just feel that the previous figures were wrong mm. and the technology has now made it difficult to announce that you have five million voters when you only had two, ah. right? So whenever people tell me that there are 200 million Nigerians, frankly speaking, I'm rather skeptical about that figure um, because I don't think it's been scientifically proved. Hmm. And so I think that this election, we have probably the most realistic figures hmm. that we have ever had. So, so, so for me, this election was a step forward and it's a classic case of how technology can improve things, mm -hmm. and technology will continue to make it more difficult to, 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 to cheat in elections. That, right. That's number one. Yeah. Then the second thing I also think is that the fact that a third party candidate, in fact, I shouldn't say a third party candidate, a third candidate who really didn't have a political party, mm. who really didn't have any structure mm. whatsoever, and came from the part of the country that is shall we say, weakest politically, mm. could come a close third mm -hmm. at his first attempt mm. against an incumbent party mm -hmm. and against another party that had been in government before is incredible. Yeah. And his votes cut across parties. Mm. Now, a lot of young people, including my children, are deeply 
sad and depressed that he didn't win because they want the change now. Now, I have to confess that when I was their age, I also said to my dad, Dad, please don't give me this story about how this is a good beginning and in five years' time you should try again. But I find myself telling my children now, mm. let's look upon this as a very good beginning. Right. Um, let him build up his political structure. Uh -huh. Let him extend support to other parts of the country and let him run in four years' time. Right. And maybe he'll win. So from my perspective, this election has been a major step forward. Mm. That's great. That's great to hear. Now, can I, can I push you to broaden your scope and, and talk about kind of what other, what other countries um, on the continent are having kind of exciting moments of opportunity or, or some crises and constraints that, that um, mm -hmm. cause concern for you? Um, I think that in almost all African countries, there are both dangers and opportunities. There are positive aspects and there are negative aspects. So, for example, if we look at a country like South Africa, while on the one hand there's pessimism about the blackouts, mm -hmm. and about the slow economic growth, I recall visiting, Af uh, I recall visiting South Africa in 1994. Mm. It's my 1993. It's my very first visit, and there was hardly any racial integration at the time. Mm. And so when I go back to South Africa, I, I measure it by where they were 30 years ago, mm. and I can see the tremendous improvement. Right. The way I look upon some of the shortages is to say, at that time, a small group of the population were able to enjoy tremendous facilities. Mm -hmm. Now they have the problem of how do we get those same services and facilities for a much larger population. That's right. There will be growing pains, obviously, but what you're attempting is much greater. Mm -hmm. So frankly speaking, I believe that South Africa has great opportunities in the future. Mm. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, we have a country that X number of years ago was in the worst of situations mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. uh, a genocide and has, over a certain period of time, come back from a terrible genocide to a place in which there is a certain amount of civil order, there's a great economic growth, mm -hmm. and is moving forward. So mm -hmm. I see possibilities there. Um, I see a Kenya that 10 to 15 years ago had elections mm -hmm. which ended in massive outbreaks mm -hmm. of violence, mm -hmm. but they've had successive elections now Mm -hmm. have gone well, right? And they are now trying to forge a path forward. Mm. And so for me, um, whether it's Kenya, whether it is uh, Uganda, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Ghana, I see great possibilities mm. in them. But before I close on this point, I want to share with you a certain philosophy I have about life. Mm. And it's a philosophy that stems from my very first week at Oxford University. And um, the political science tutor, he asked, told all of us, you know, um, in politics you can never be sure of anything. So never make a prediction whether the Republicans or the Democrats are going to win. You may get it wrong. However, he said, there are four or five things that you can be sure about in politics. I, I want to share with you the four or five things that he told us that we could be certain about the future. And I want to say also that all of us in the class, students, we all agreed with him, were the impossible things. Number one, while England is making great strides with women, and there are two women in the cabinet, we will not in our lifetime see a female prime minister in England. This was 1973. By 1979, that prediction. Whew. The second prediction was that while we are seeing an easing of tensions between East Germany and West Germany. We will not see in our lifetime the pulling down of the Berlin Wall and the unification of Germany. We all agreed. Third, while we all praise the great efforts by Sakharov 
Solzhenitsyn, the great dissident in speaking against repression, when you think of the KGB and you think of the Communist Party, we will not in our lifetime see the elimination of the monopoly of power of the Communist Party in Russia. Mm. By 1989, that was gone. Then the fourth thing they said was that, yes, we're having these boycotts of South Africa, but Kim, you sitting here, will not in your lifetime be able to walk down the streets of Cape Town and Johannesburg. Mm. At that time, I thought it was true. And therefore, when my wife turned 40, I made a point of walking down the streets of Cape Town and Johannesburg. And the fifth and the last was he saluted Martin Luther King and stated that in our lifetimes, we won't see a black president of the United States. So the way I look upon life is the following. Am I in a position that could look more hopeless than it must have looked to Mandela in 1973, six to seven years after he had been placed in jail, imagining that one day he would be president of South Africa and South Africa would be changed. Mm. If my condition looks more bleak than that, then I can give up, all right? <laughs> but I don't think our situation, given all these examples, looks more bleak than it must have looked at that time. And therefore, for me, optimism is realistic. Mm. And therefore, we should constantly challenge ourselves by giving ourselves big projects and big journeys, but at the same time, work hard to take the concrete steps that you need to get to those big journeys. Mm. So that is why I'm an optimist. I love that. I love that. I have a similar personal story. Not that there's any moral equivalence, but I was very a serious ballerina when I was young. And so we'd have to audition for summer school and ballets and parts and all of this. And our ballet mistress said, you can never cry until you've been rejected 100 times. <laughs> then you can cry. <laughs> so I, I'm a natural optimist as well. Yeah. <laughs> can I ask you, so one, one of the cross-cutting things that makes a lot of people feel quite anxious, some hopeless, some ho hopeful, is, is climate change, right? And, and our ability... To, to mitigate and adapt. And so can you speak to us a little bit about, about the, the nexus of climate change and, and livelihood, particularly of the poor? Because yes. um, uh, you know, a lot of the costs are born in countries that are not part of the emissions problem, particularly, and are, are going to have to adapt in real time. Yes. You know, I think that um, climate change is the central challenge that the world is facing and will face for the next 20 to 30 years at least. It is the challenge that can only be solved by worldwide cooperation. And so part of the reason why I feel very sad about the current political and economic splits in the world right now, they make the task of cooperation, which is central to climate change, more difficult. Um, I think that uh, Africa in particular um, has often looked upon climate change as something that is distant, mm. all right, and something that does not affect us immediately. But if you look at the whole of the Sahelian region, mm -hmm. you will find there has been an irreversible process of desertification. Mm -hmm. You will find that in areas like Lake Chad, which were agricultural areas, those lakes have dried up, and the livelihood of the people there has been severely eroded. Now, those areas are today populated by Islamic fundamentalists and by bandits. Mm. Now, you can either look at that problem as purely a problem of religion, or you can look at it more accurately as the consequences of the failure to address climate change and the way in which people under those conditions turn to
to, shall we say, wrong leaders and wrong prophets. And therefore, I think climate change is something that all African countries, they, we must address those things. And thankfully, we have the technology today to do that. And I think we have the will to do that. And because I think that, I think that the new technologies um, for renewable energies are also opportunities for various African countries. Mm. And, um, and the sooner we get about it, I think the better. Yeah, great. I have a few more questions for you, but I think why don't we break it up a bit and take some from the audience, and then we can come back um, to speak. So anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Yeah. So in the US, we've been struggling with our 8% inflation. Nigeria has faced far, far worse. How do you deal with um, inflation and foreign exchange issues that have faced Nigeria? All right. Um, the first thing I, should, I would like to remind you is that um, I left business school in 1980, and I believe that around that time, inflation in the United States was somewhere around 20%. All right? And so were interest rates. Uh, so that you probably have as much experience in this that I have. All right? <laughs> that said, that said, um, I've come to certain conclusions. One is that Ultimately, you have to have macroeconomic balance, ultimately. And, and, and by, that, you know, by that, I just I mean that a certain control of the money supply, not necessarily to the level that the Friedmanites believe, but that you can't keep printing money irrespective. That's number one. Um, secondly, that you can only resist the market to a certain extent on exchange rates, and that therefore there are certain economic fundamentals that we all have to adhere to if we are going to restrict inflation, which is of critical importance, and, and if we are therefore going to achieve growth. Now, that said, that said, I also feel that governments have a crucial role to play because I think that if you leave everything to the market, I think that it asks businessmen and women to take certain kinds of risks that they will not take and there are certain solutions that the market cannot provide. So for example, in the United States, without the kind of measures that I think President Biden has started taking, the shift to renewable energies would have been much more difficult than, than otherwise. And therefore, I think that it's that mix of government intervention while having a vigorous private market which allows for competition within a, state, within a country in which the macroeconomic fundamentals are respected that I think is a solution to inflation and to inflation with growth and with a certain amount of equity. Uh, my name is Leonard Wancheko. I'm from uh, Republic of Benin. I'm a professor at Princeton University. Ah, yes. I'm visiting here. Yes. So I really, really share your optimism uh, about Africa, about Nigeria in particular. And to add to what you have said, um, you know, the GDP per capita of African countries have doubled mm -hmm. in the past 20 years. And there, are, there is a conversion theory being developed by I mean, the economy is showing that Africa look very much like the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So, which is, you, you know, very much in line with what you said. Now, um, I would like you to comment on education, higher education, research, and innovation. Uh, as the founder of the African School of Economics, I strongly believe that progress, development will come from investment in upper tail, high level human capital. Others think that Africa needs to focus on vocational training, primary education, and so on. So I would like to, you know, be given your background, given your experience, what is your take on higher education research versus vocational training and basic education, uh, you know, on the continent as, you know, for development, not only political, but also economic development. Thank you. But you know that you have given me the perfect escape. 
because you know that I'm going to say we need both. <laughs> All right? Um, but um, nonetheless, let me address the question um, a little bit more seriously. Um, and that is to say, my generation received an education that was very much about Roman history, English history, how many wives King Henry VIII had. <laughs> we had an education which is about the prairies in Canada, all right, and the Russian winters, and we were very well versed in Shakespeare. I can still recite my Shakespeare. <laughs> now, it is true to say that that kind of education, the elements of it that are still helpful, because I think that to study the abuse of power of Macbeth is a lesson for all communities all over the world. But I do think that some of these lessons can be taught via African history, by American history, that learning about technology, learning about accounting, learning about law is crucial for the development of leaders. So I think that there is a certain, um, there's a certain education that leaders need, and that type of education needs to be looked at again and again for the world that we live in today. So that is crucial. I think an important element of that leadership training has to do with how you lead different groups of people and people who are different from you. And therefore, for me, leadership that cuts across, as I said, religion, country, race, ethnicity is fundamental. So that is on one aspect. At the same time, we need to look at what the world is going to look like in 30 years' time. And so, for example, there is definitely going to be a shortage of people in the area of coding, for example. Therefore, without any doubt, we have to train the hundreds of thousands, the millions of people who will be coding in the kind of technological era that we're moving into, as well as people who are going to be the plumbers, the carpenters, the farmers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that important is that we must have respect for those who do the coding, for those who do the plumbing, for those who work in agriculture, and we can't have the attitude that education breeds one type of person who is superior and another part, group of people who are substandard, because I think that a great country requires both. Uh, if I can uh, thank you for being here, my daughter told me that there was a very brilliant professor from Princeton who should really be the person who should be giving the talk today. <laughs> yeah, I want to I encourage, on the theme of education, I want to encourage some of the students uh, to get involved. In, and some of you are at a disadvantage because we know who you are and we're not afraid to cold call. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Nia Cech. I'm a tech entrepreneur and I'm originally from Cameroon. Okay. So my question to you is, uh, do you think the United States needs an Africa Marshall Plan? Because we look at the problems that exist in Africa from political to economic to social. It's very, very hard to pinpoint where to start from. So like in Cameroon, we've had a president for over 40 years. While in college, some of us were like politically active and it was a lot harder to make change than you would normally think. Same thing in Nigeria, there's like the uh, problem of gerontocracy, which exists in most African countries. So. Europe went through devastation in the First and Second World Wars, and the United States came in. I think that void currently exists in Africa. And I think China, um, countries like China and Russia, are taking advantage of that void. And I think uh, the United States has to play like a more pivotal role in Africa when it comes to like building these political institutions, ensuring the long-term sustainability because Africa's population is growing within the next 20 to 30 years. So from your perspective and your experience, uh, do you think we need something uh, of the sort of a Marshall Plan for Africa in general? Yeah. Um, I would say that first and foremost, um, 
I have a certain skepticism to large plans that are prepared out of the continent. I think that the people of a country need to think clearly for themselves where they want to go. And they need to know how they want to get there. And then I think that it is for them to mobilize domestic capital, their domestic skills, and mobilize international capital and international skills okay, towards a destination that they have clearly outlined. Because it's only when that happens that you have domestic leaders who own the problem, who own the solution, because ultimately they have to execute. And if they do not execute, there's no amount of money that is poured into a country that is going to change that country. So that, that's number one. The second thing I'd like to say is that, and it was put very nicely by a, a friend of mine, so I'll borrow from his. You see, Africa cannot be a football stadium in which China and America are playing Super Bowl. It cannot be. I think that both China and the United States can make a huge contribution in investments in the continent, and we should welcome both. Both of them have certain amazing qualities and abilities. The United States, the, technolog the technological developments, the can-do spirit, the entrepreneurial zeal is extraordinary, and we need that on the continent. Now, within China as well, their abilities and some of their business models are also remarkable. Now, we shouldn't forget that one third of China still lives in comparative poverty. And therefore, I've seen Chinese businessmen and companies that are very happy to work in the rural areas of Africa. It's very difficult to get or to expect somebody who grew up in upper middle class Palo Alto to spend the next 15 years maintaining a cell site in rural Africa. That is asking a lot of the person. There are many well-to-do Africans who wouldn't want their kids doing that. But there are a lot of Chinese companies and Chinese workers who, given where they come from, that is normal for them. So, 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 so um, I don't want the United States to be involved in Africa as competition to China. I genuinely believe that there is a role for both countries within the continent, and that both countries have a great amount to contribute. Can I ask you one follow-up question on that in terms of the, the supercharged Super Bowl, given that the increasing tensions between the US and China, how do you see those kind of bilateral tensions spilling over into how, how constructively they bring capital and innovation and business models? Well, um, they, so far, it has not they're there. So far, they have not spilled over in a dramatic fashion. Mm. Of course, um, on those occasions when um, a road is built, um, Huawei supplies telecommunications equipment, the United States ambassador is not happy. Right? Um, it's gone that far. But so far, we have, I don't think we've had many examples where there have been threats. Mm. That is, you either work you work with them, you cannot work with us. And my hope is that that continues. Um, I think that for many years, um, the United States and Europe uh, were not that interested in investing in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, in fairness to American business folks, the fact is that the United States by itself is a huge market. And if I was an American, the fact is that there is enough within the United States for me to be a successful business person in, and therefore it takes an extra effort to start thinking of markets outside the United States. That's the reality 
of being in the largest market in the world. And I don't think the US can be blamed for that. Hmm. Now, obviously, for Europeans who have a small market at home, they will always have a greater need for international trade. And a country like China, international trade is fundamental to their own existence. So different countries will approach this question differently. Um, I think that the United, there's much more interest uh, in the United, uh, by United States in Africa right now. And I think that part of our responsibility, that is uh, uh, people like myself who have uh, worked and lived in the United States and have worked and lived in Africa, is to do what we can in making sure that Americans have a realistic picture of Africa, that it's not a picture of uh, poverty and refugees, it's a nuanced picture, and therefore build the bridges that will enable more US investment onto the African continent. And I think that we can do that. Mm. Great. Let me take some questions, particularly encourage some students to jump in. Somebody over here. There we go. Is that James? Yeah, go for it. Hi, everyone. James DaCosta. Fortunate enough to be a student in both of your classes uh, right now as a first-year MBA student. Um, but something I've been thinking about uh, a lot recently is how we can build kind of more bridges between Silicon Valley and the technology aspect mm -hmm. and back on the continent, you know, especially with ChatGPT, um, version 4 coming out the other day, AI, a number of mm -hmm. other trends. And I know we've been talking a little bit about it in your class, Hakeem. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder kind of if you have any thoughts about building more bridges between, you know, the West Coast and Africa or, you know, technology bridges between the U.S. and Africa or Nigeria in particular. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think the first thing that we have to do is to stop um, or is to eliminate this notion that we're far away from each other. Mm. Um, um, at the most basic levels, uh, I remember when talking to um, my dear wife about a child of ours going to California, her first comment was, that is far away. All right? And I think that we still operate with that notion in our heads, but technology has taken that away. Mm. You know, and the fact of the matter is that there is a remarkable can-do spirit which is in California more than any other part of the United States. Mm. Um, the Texans may disagree. But, um, but, I do, but I do think very seriously that um, we here at Stanford, right, and uh, we here at institutions like the Seeds, like which the Kings have so kindly created, we stand in a position to be that bridge between the continent and Silicon Valley. And that attitude and that technology that is very present there can do extraordinary things on the continent. So um, I'm delighted when I'm speaking to people like you to hear about your trips to Nairobi and speaking to Julia, who's coming to, battling to come to Lagos and has just been approved for Accra. We're still working on Lagos. I'm delighted that you're a generation of Americans that doesn't see the gap and is eager and excited to do such work and to assure you that you have your African counterparts that are happy to work with you as partners. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sam Akinwande. Thank you for coming out to speak to us. So you mentioned earlier that many people in my generation will have to wear multiple hats in the course of our careers. And I know from being involved in the Nigerian community here on campus that many of us are thinking about starting as like operators, entrepreneurs, and then transitioning into potential political leadership. So I'm curious about what you think we should be doing right now to best position ourselves for that potential future leadership role? Like what should we be doing right now, especially if we're not in the business, especially if we're like engineers or other builders? All right, um, pre preparing your, you said, the question please, is preparing yourselves for leadership positions, correct? So starting as like operator. Yes, okay. Um, if I can just give a, an answer that you may find a bit boring, but I give it to all my students, and uh, the first thing I say is that please take your courses that you're studying very seriously, <laughs> okay? And try to get A's in them as much as you can, all right? Because I think there's a time for everything, 
right? And I honestly think that while you're in college, you have a tremendous array of truly brilliant faculty members in a whole range of issues. And that immersing yourself in what they are teaching is of enormous value to you. And that even if they're not teaching courses on Africa, when I was in university, I found fascinating just reading about how the United States, for example, moved away in Chicago from a Chicago dominated by Al Capone to a Chicago that produced Adlai Stevenson X number of years later, and understanding the process by which machine politicians lost control of the democratic process of the United States and politics became cleaned up. There are lessons to be learned from that, just as there are lessons to be learned from classes that talk about the progress in India, in South Korea, in many other countries in the world. Though they're not on Africa, there's a tremendous amount to learn from them. So, so the first thing I want to say is that please use the resource here that you have here because you will not have a time again in your life in which you have coming together such, array, such a rich array of truly great, brilliant minds. Okay, that's one. The second thing I'd like to say is that precisely because you're at a place like Stanford, which in a sense is more immersed in entrepreneurship and technology than probably any other university in this country, with the possible exception of maybe MIT, you also have the opportunity to do those courses that enable you to get involved in startups. You have the, you have the opportunity and the ability to work over, over, over your summers in different parts of the continent, and therefore to begin to try out your ideas or begin to be mentored by people who are already in the field and are willing to give you a, a chance and an opportunity to work on the continent. And I think you should take those opportunities as well. But, but please um, don't try to jump in immediately. The work that you're doing right now is of crucial importance. Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a student from Germany, a happily reunited Germany. And <laughs> <laughs> actually before I was even born. So I'm happy that change happened. And I do believe in change. I had the opportunity to take Professor Casey's class um, and think about strategies beyond markets. And I'm wondering about how countries can build a competitive advantage. My home country, Germany, has for the past few decades been very focused on exports and has had at least a competitive advantage in manufacturing high quality cars, which a lot of people enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether that advantage is eroding. I'm worried about it, certainly. And I'm thinking about other countries around the world and now I'm wondering how you see Nigeria competing on this now so much more connected mm -hmm. global stage and how you see African nations building competitive advantages? Okay. Um, that is a difficult question. Um, it's difficult because, um, on the one hand, it is possible to study and to try to ascertain where are my competitive advantages, and therefore to build an industrial policy based on that. It's quite it's possible. Some countries have done that and have got it completely wrong as to where they think their competitive advantage is supposed to be. Um, and um, I wouldn't like to mention their names, but some are in Europe. I put it that way. Clearly, there are some countries, and I think Japan is one country, I think Korea is another country, I think Singapore is another country, that have tried to study where is our advantage and how do we, how do, we do it. So I think it's something that, each country needs to study seriously. And I think that um, um, an important amount of academic and consulting work needs to be done in, in that particular area. And I don't presume to already know it. That's one. Um, I think that a part of it 
will simply come from the concrete experiences of businesses. Okay. Um, and, and, and after a while, you will see those businesses that succeed and those that, that fail. Now, if I'm to take a guess for Nigeria, I would say certainly those businesses that I think have gas as a basis, because I think that what is going to happen is that there will be, um, there'll be elements of the energy equation that will no longer be used, utilized by oil and gas for partly for, fossil, for, partly for, 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 for global warming issues. But I think that there will be those elements that will continue to be important. I think that when we look at some of the critical minerals that will be needed in the new economy, many of those are in Nigeria, and I think we need to use them. And then I also think that our population, which is large, though not as large as some of the figures have indicated, I think could form the basis of a manufacturing environment in the country. Um, but for that to be successful, we have to have an infrastructure that can ensure that you can do that at a low cost. And then I think also that given the high quality of many of the young Nigerians, I think that elements of what India has done in outsourcing can be done in a Nigeria at an even lower cost than is currently being done in India. And, in the same time zone as and it's in the same time zone as Europe. So, 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 so my own, so these are my, shall I say, these are my guesses. I would like to say somewhat educated guesses, right? But it's something that we need to do much more work in. And I hope that somebody does a good doctoral thesis on that topic. <laughs> Hopefully you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Ayatunde. I'm a sophomore here studying ms &E, and I just had a question about something you spoke about earlier. So you spoke about young African talent at institutions like this playing their part in governance as a potential solution. So, sorry, young Africans? Talent. Talent, yes. Yes, playing their part in governance in Africa yes. as a potential solution to infusing African governance with competent individuals. Yes. Um, however, when thinking about the common Nigerian masses, what role do you think education plays in like galvanizing them with common shared ideals about systems of governance, political awareness, and just like nationalistic ideals? And what practical steps do you think we can take to getting there? I know you mentioned the ALA uh, previously, and I think that's one great example, but I think the reach is very limited, and I'm think, like trying to think about scalable solutions for the common masses. All right, um, I think that um, whether in Nigeria, or whether in, in Europe or in the United States, I think that those of us who are highly educated, we often have this view that the problem are these masses who just don't get it, who just don't understand. But I think that a lot of the times, the quote unquote masses get it more than we realize but I think that in many cases, they have become somewhat cynical because they have had leaders after leaders who have promised many things and not delivered. And uh, in Nigeria, or as an example, I think that the fact that so many of the, so many individuals within what you would call the masses voted for the third candidate without a huge amount of effort by that candidate tells us that those folks are much more aware than we ever thought. And I think that it is ultimately for leaders like yourself and like others to take that responsibility seriously and to craft a message, to craft a vision to them, for them, that says one, we can build a better country. Secondly, that in doing so, your standards of living can get better than they are right now, because that is of crucial importance to, 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 to everybody. That we can live together, and not a message that, that is based 
on fear. Because too many of the messages that are based, that we have for politicians in the context, are based on fear. Fear of another ethnic group. Fear of immigrants. And that is a powerful tool, but we now need leaders to use a different tool that in a sense is inspiring and is encouraging. And I think ultimately that you're of a generation, which is probably not different from my generation, in which we were told by our parents, avoid politics. Go into, go into the private sector, be a professional. But I think that there's an ancient saying, I think by a great Greek philosopher that said that if good people do not get involved in public things, we are condemned to be ruled by fools. One, one last question here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ibi Lola. I'm a student here studying energy. Um, my question kind of sits at the nexus of climate change and development strategy. I know you talked a bit about climate change, but my question is regarding industrialization, which seems to be the only way forward for African development to really occur and be sustainable. There's also this growing... Um, degrowth mentality and ideology growing, particularly outside of the continent as far as needing to reduce, um, you know, the emissions uh, that we emit, um, but at the expense of potentially Africa's development. My question is, how do you define responsible development in the context of this changing world and what does that look like to you? All right, um, it's very interesting because um, uh, this issue um, was fought over and discussed when I was in college myself. All right? And it was the battle between those who felt that we were reaching the limits to growth in the world economy, that um, we, need, we must be concerned about the environment, and that the environment and keeping a good environment imposed limits to growth. And there was a group set, and I'm happy to tell you this, um, led by a group of scientists at the MIT um, who formed a group called the Club of Rome, and they were convinced that natural resources were going to run out if we did not impose these limits to growth. Now, I'm happy to say that the MIT scientists were wrong, obviously, but it was a serious debate that took place at the time. And I think that the correct answer really was that we can have growth that is compatible with respect for the environment. And that being careful about the environment is fundamental to long-term growth. So that same argument is happening today. And therefore, there are many Africans who have the view that in being to talk to about renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we are being told that we should not grow. And my own sense about it is, I think, the reverse. I think there's a huge opportunity for the African continent to grow on the basis of renewable energies, for example, and that that constitutes a huge opportunity and that in some senses, it may bring development to the continent much faster than if we go the conventional route of fossil fuels, whose problems we then have to resolve before we go the route of renewable energies. So in short, that is an issue that has been tackled before, and the answer is the same, that growth on these responsible lines are quite possible and, in fact, to be recommended. Coming up on time, and I just want to say you've been incredibly generous with your time and your wisdom and your optimism, and we really thank you for spending time with us. Please join me. Um, if, I, if I would like to, I would just once again like to um, thank Bill and Dottie. Um, they have many things to do um, than listen to this somewhat crazy Nigerian professor from a very strange business school. So I thank them very much again for coming. Um, and, I just, and I would like to say to you that in my, when I was in my 20s, um, I found it very inspiring 
uh, to be at occasions in which uh, much older people who had tremendous experience were at many of these events because their presence confirmed to me that the questions that were being discussed were very important. And, um, and so I thank you again for coming. And to all of you who have been here who are younger, um, please, um, it's great to have role models that you can emulate. And I hope that in your various countries that you can do as much um, as the kings have done for this country and for the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>